So what we're going to talk about today is phase diagrams. And here's a typical phase diagram. This is the phase diagram of CO2. What you'll notice running up the y-axis is pressure. So starting at the bottom, it's low pressure increasing as you go up. And what runs along the x-axis is temperature. Starting at the left, it's low temperature. And as you go to the right, you're increasing temperature. So point A is how you would typically find carbon dioxide, or what we call dry ice at the grocery store. At one atmosphere, that is a pressure that's standard at sea level. So you might go into the grocery store and find dry ice in the solid form. It's in a cooler that's at 80 degrees below zero Celsius. And as you well know, when you bring that out of the cooler, the pressure remains the same in the, in the room, but the temperature starts to rise, and it'll rise up to 20 degrees C, which is roughly around 70 Fahrenheit. And as this diagram shows, dry ice solid, one atmosphere at minus 80, will go directly from the solid to the gaseous state without going through a liquid transition, or it sublimates. On the other hand, if you started with the same dry ice at minus 80 C, one atmosphere, and now you just went straight up in pressure, you started increasing the pressure on it until you got up to like 20 atmospheres, it would now be in the solid state, but now you can start raising the temperature. We're going to maintain that same pressure it will act like many materials we know that as you take a solid and you start to heat them up they're gonna they're gonna melt and become liquid and then if you continue to heat them up they'll become gaseous another parameter that you can watch on a phase diagram that correlates with pressure is actually density and let me explain what I mean by that we have what represents four moles of carbon dioxide gas in a cylinder and then I put a piston up above this uh, closed cylinder and if we were to figure out the density of this gas right now, you take the four moles total, divide it by two liters, and that would give us a, a molar density of two moles per liter. So now imagine that you increase the pressure. So you start lowering that piston, and the pressure would increase, but also the density would increase. Now we're to a one liter volume. So if we did the calculation four moles, divided by one liter, you have a four mole per liter density. The result from that is that density increases with pressure, and that's generally true with gases. So now knowing that density and pressure are directly related, you could put density on this phase diagram. As I have plotted here, density is increasing going from bottom to top along the y-axis. So if I start at point A, now I have carbon dioxide. I've raised the temperature a little bit from the earlier example. So it's somewhere around minus 56.4 degrees C. And now I'm going to start raising the pressure, i.e. raising the density. And of course it would become liquid now as it becomes more and more dense. And that makes sense. Think about something that's gaseous and you start to pressurize it and the particles get closer together, they become liquid. And then you increase the pressure even more and it becomes solid, point C. So the interpretation here is if you see one of these phase diagrams and that solid liquid line is sloping a little to the right, then the solid is more dense than the liquid. Now there's some other points on the phase diagram that are important to talk about. One of them is right here where the three lines, the solid gas line, the solid liquid line, and the liquid gas line all converge. This is called the triple point. In the triple point, dynamic equilibrium exists between solid, liquid, and gas. Most materials which have a uh, right sloping solid liquid line, there is no liquid state achievable at temperatures below the triple point. The other point is up here at the top where it looks like this liquid gas line just evaporates. That's called critical point. This is a point above which materials in the supercritical fluid state. And a supercritical fluid is basically a fluid that displays both properties of gases and liquids. So usually in terms of how it's like a gas, it's very compressible. 
and how it's like a liquid. It will often have solubility much like the liquid. So we make use of this supercritical fluid uh, dry cleaning solutions like carbon dioxide. And here's just an example. So we're going to start at carbon dioxide. The temperature is 31 degrees C, which is not that hard to obtain. And the uh, pressure is fairly high. So if you look over here on your phase diagram, you can see if you were at 31 degrees and you got the pressure up, you'd, be in, you'd actually have supercritical carbon dioxide. When the pressure's high, it starts to act like a liquid. So you basically have carbon dioxide liquid. And carbon dioxide is nonpolar, so when it gets in the presence of grease, which is also nonpolar, like dissolves like, and by weak van der Waals attraction, it would actually dissolve the grease. So now you have this grease dissolved up in the carbon dioxide. You can now bring that away from the material that you're trying to dry clean. Then the next step, is you drop the pressure. This converts the CO2 back to its gaseous state, which lowers its ability to dissolve grease, which causes the grease to separate from the cleaning solution. And then you can recycle your carbon dioxide. And now we're ready to do another cleaning cycle. In order to do that, though, we need liquid. So all we have to do then is increase the pressure, and that'll change back to carbon dioxide liquid. And you can repeat the cycle. Now, this supercritted Critical fluid technology is used to clean laundry. It's how you can decaffeinate coffee, uh, remo remove nicotine from tobacco, and fat from tater chips. So now we're going to look at a phase diagram of water. Start at point A, gaseous water. As you raise it up to point B, increasing the pressure, you can actually turn it to ice. And if you raise the pressure some more, it turns to water. So now this is where it's unique in that water is denser than ice, and we know that to be true. And if you look on a phase diagram, a general way to see that this trend is happening is that the line between the solid and liquid is actually sloping to the left as opposed to sloping to the right like it did in carbon dioxide. Another thing that you uh, know about water, and it's true of most solvents, that you can boil liquids by dropping the pressure, and this allows you to boil liquids without raising the temperature to dangerously high temperatures, sometimes at high temperatures you uh, promote ex uh, explosions or oxidation reactions. So if you can keep the temperature down, you can still boil it safely. And now I'm going to show you an example of how pressure affects boiling. So we're all familiar with boiling. In this case, uh, we have water. These are inert freezers, they're called. They're just inert chips that have a lot of surface area. So the liquid water is turning to gas right there. And this is at a temperature here in Colorado of about 92 degrees Celsius. So another way to get water to boil, this water is, is obviously not so hot that I can't handle it. It's uh, well below the 92 where it boils temperature-wise. So the temperature's dropped. So now what we're going to do is hook it up to this vacuum line and lower the pressure. And once you start to pull vacuum on it, and lower the pressure, it immediately begins to boil again. So that's another way to cause things to boil. The temperature hasn't increased at all. We're just dropping the pressure in the headspace. So I hope this has helped you understand phase diagrams.